everybody. Thank you so much, Esther. So I should probably give you a little bit of who I am for those of you who I'm brand new to. I'm married to Nathan, who spoke a couple of weeks ago, and our two little children in the French crew window are giving a little wave at Samaya and Elijah. They're my little delights. And we were a part of Fields. We joined, it will be eight years in sort of October time, I think, that we joined Fields. Last couple of years, we've spent on the wrong side of the border in Costa del Norfolk, but we've come back to sunny Suffolk and it was the right decision. So we're happy. We've been back about a year now, which seems madness because we've obviously not been able to get to know many of you with all the restrictions, but we're happy to be back and enjoying being back part of Fields. And I really, before I say anything else, I should just say thank you to pastors Richard and Esther, because when we joined the church, I was not in a good way. And some of what they've contributed to my journey of recovery, they'll never know. Other bits, they're fully aware. <laughs> and I just i am so grateful for the impact that they've had on my life, for their faithful sacrifice to the church family over the years to really keep plugging away and building faith in our lives because it makes a difference. And I know sometimes that's a thankless task, but I want to say thank you now while I have the platform. So thank you guys so much. You are amazing. And then before I kick off, I'm just going to pray again. I don't think you can pray too much. <laughs> so Father, I just thank you that you take over my words now. Thank you that the things I share are going to be from your heart that are going to go into the hearts of those who are listening. I will just pray for transformation in people's lives, Lord God, that the things that you've been teaching me can be a lesson to others as well. And I just thank you that it would be your word and not mine this morning that is spoken out to this beautiful church family. So we commit this morning to you in your mighty, precious name, Jesus. Amen. So stories are powerful. Simon Scott spoke last week. If you haven't had a chance to listen to him, please go onto YouTube or the website and find his message because his testimony is incredible. And to see him now, you would never know what he's walked through. And I just think it's the more we can hear people's stories and their journeys, the more encouragement we can find in our own. And I know that's been a help to me over the years. So as Esther said, I'm picking up on our series, Free Indeed, and our series verse is John 8, 36. Therefore, if the sun makes you free, you shall be free indeed. What an amazing scripture. And when I heard this was the scripture, I could immediately remember the first time that that scripture had really made me sit up and pay attention. And it was about eight years ago. So just before we joined Fields Church that summer, our family had moved to Ipswich. We'd been living in Dis. So we'd spent more time over the board. I don't know what we've been doing. Anyway, we're staying in Suffolk now. It's the best place to be. So it was Nathan and I and our little Elijah was about 18 months old. No Samaya on the cards yet. And we'd just moved back to Ipswich. We'd had a really difficult series of circumstances. And we were sitting in the 2013 Hillsong Conference at the O2, packed out with people. And there was a song on their new album, which was called Where the Spirit of the Lord Is. And that's based on a slightly different scripture, Where the Spirit of the Lord Is, There Is Freedom. But this verse as well played a massive part in that conference and in their teaching. And at the time, I was in a real mess and so I think the scripture stood out to me because I needed that and I didn't I didn't understand I was hearing something from the platform that was written in God's word that I didn't have an experience of in my life so many of you will already know my story and I apologize for those of you who do but for those of you who don't this is a bit of a whistle whistle top whistle top whistle stop tour and my message this morning is a bit too half. So I know we've got the Euros. I'm going to try my best to be finished by at least the beginning of the second half. So you'll be able to see a little bit of the football. Uh, but the first half of my message this morning is going to be my story. The second half is going to be my A, B, C, D, ways to get free. OK, guys, so stick with me and we're going to find some freedom at the end of all this, I hope. So my story first. Uh, I had a pretty normal childhood, really, as normal as normal can be. I was really well, healthy kid, pretty confident, had lots of friends, did well at school, nothing really major to report. Uh, I became a Christian about the age of 15. My family were Christian, so that wasn't a sort of complicated journey for me, really. Um, but where I really want to start with you guys is when I was at university. I was about 22 years of age, and as I said, I'd been perfectly healthy up to this point. 
but I started having some very unpleasant symptoms while I was away at university, which was quite scary, wasn't near any of my family, didn't really have any experience of doctors or hospitals or procedures, but had to start sort of undergoing that process on my own, which was quite a worry. Uh, and eventually was diagnosed with something called ulcerative colitis, which you may or may not have heard of. I'd never heard of it when I was told I had it, but it's basically ulceration through your digestive system. So it has a lot of impact. It impacts your uh, diet. It impacts going to the toilet. It impacts uh, the amount of nourishment that you're able to receive from your food because things aren't working how they should be. Uh, it affected my sleep. It was really a massive life knock. A lot of the things that I had planned to be doing in my future suddenly looked in jeopardy. It was incredibly humiliating because of some of the symptoms. I felt like I couldn't go out of the house because I was worried about if the symptoms would come on while I was out, would I be able to get to a toilet or would I be able to? It was just really, it really gave me a very limited quality of life and I became incredibly poorly with it. And then it got to the point where I was either, um, up to the hill on medication, or I was just incredibly, incredibly unwell. And unfortunately, it was quite aggressive. It didn't respond to the medication after a little while. So then came to the position where it was quite a difficult decision, but I needed to have some major surgery. It was about 25 that was gonna be quite life-changing. So I've got a stoma now. Some of you know what that is, some of you don't. If you don't, I'm not gonna explain it, but it basically it changes your life. And it was a big decision. And Nathan, who I'd married in this period of time, was really, really supportive in coming to that decision. And we got to the point where I had the surgery, had recovered mostly from the surgery, getting used to my new life and thought it's over. And actually so thankful in that moment to God that he'd used doctors and hospitals to bring me through what was a real health crisis. Uh, and, and you kind of just go and take a deep breath and think, I've made it over the line, but um, in the kind of quest to getting back on with life, we quickly fell pregnant with Elijah. And it was then that really it, my health problems sort of racketed up a notch uh, compared to what I'd already experienced. I was in a really bad way during my pregnancy and it was partly to do with probably getting pregnant a bit quick after my surgery. So they they still don't really know what happened, but they think maybe some scar tissue got involved. And anyway, as Elijah grew, I became more and more unwell. I couldn't hold down any food or liquid. So as you can imagine, that becomes quite an urgent situation quite quickly. Uh, the hospital didn't really know what to do and quite difficult to treat someone who's pregnant. You can't do the same tests and give the same drugs that you might normally if they weren't carrying a baby. And so already anxious to be first time parents, we were sort of faced with this big health tragedy, not knowing whether I would make it through the pregnancy, certainly not knowing whether Elijah would make it through the pregnancy. And it was incredibly frightening. And if you speak to Nate, he will give you the whole other side of it. I was not really very present or with it during those months because I, I had no reserve and I was incredibly unwell in a lot of pain a lot of the time and in hospital for most of that the last bits of the pregnancy. So eventually they made the decision to give me an emergency C-section. This was at 32 weeks, which is two months early. So we then had a little premature baby pop into the world at three pounds 11, little, little fighter. And, and so then we had a new situation. Fortunately at that point, my body started to respond better and I began to go on the journey of recovering my health and strength from that time. But we had a little man in the incubator who it became clear quite quickly had his own health concerns. He had uh, some issues with his heart, which uh, we were told would have to be heavily monitored and would probably lead to some later surgery, which he did have to go for a procedure about nine months old. Um, and 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 it was just a it was a really, really hard time. I think for any of you who've had the joy of taking home your first baby, that's a frightening experience in itself. But off the back of what we'd walked through, it was really, really hard. And I don't I'm not telling you all this because I want sympathy because I absolutely don't. But I want you to see the layers of what God had to work through in me. So I've had this physical challenge. There are still physical challenges going on with my body at this point, but uh, they were really more or less pushed into the background as my mental health just 
ended up in a complete mess. So I'd gone from healthy, confident, full of faith to a physical, emotional and absolute mental health wreck over the course of a few years. And because a lot of the things that had happened had been related to health and your body and physical symptoms, my anxiety towards health situations was absolutely through the roof. Any small symptom that I felt in my body was like a major thing. If I had a headache, I thought I had a brain tumour. If I felt a bit dizzy, I felt like my levels were all out, I must be diabetic. And the number of times that I was on the NHS website or looking up symptoms to read what was the matter with me, it became an obsession that everything must, I must have every worst possible condition that exists under the sun. And some of you will understand what it feels like to be in that place. I started experiencing panic attacks, which was something I'd never had any experience of myself in the past. I was giddy, had funny pains in my head, my eyes wouldn't focus, I felt sick a lot of the time. And if any of you have walked severe anxiety, you know what that feels like. It's very real, the symptoms you experience, but it's hard to explain and you feel like nobody would understand anyway and so I had this little world that I started to build around myself to try and shrink down what I could control we still had this little baby in the house with his own issues going on I eventually went to the doctors to speak about these symptoms that I was experiencing and they prescribed me some beta blockers and this is the extent of my anxiety I read the side effects and they talked about if you have low blood pressure you shouldn't take them and I sometimes have low blood pressure. So I, the thing that I was there given to me to help me, I was so scared of taking because I thought it would just exacerbate my symptoms. I didn't even take it. So I was just almost like punishing myself, not, not doing the things that were given to me to help. I used to take Elijah out in the buggy and just pace around in the village that we lived in. And I'd do it for hours because my biggest fear was that with the giddiness that I felt, I was gonna just pass out on the floor and there would be nobody there to, to find me. Nath would be at work, baby would be left on his own crying and I would be there just helpless on the floor. And that, that was my fear. That's what I believed would happen. And I thought it would happen any day, any moment. So I just walked around in public. I didn't really want to be with other people, but I did not want to be on my own. So I just walked around in public. So someone would find me if that happened. And I didn't know that it would ever feel better. It was completely terrifying, completely took away my quality of life. And it was, it was like a prison. It, I was so fearful and I don't know about you guys but maybe your story is similar to mine I'd had this physical battle which I definitely felt enslaved to but now this mental health issue this anxiety had become my prison and there are many things that can become our prisons maybe yours is like mine maybe it's anxiety but maybe it's something more subtle a bit of insecurity maybe a bit of heightened expectation that we put on ourselves that forces us to overwork ourselves or try to please others all the time perhaps you have got illness perhaps it's one of the more obvious things like a physical issue or or debt maybe or there's so many things that can enslave us and make us feel like we're imprisoned and make us start to lose hope of a better future so it was around this time when my anxiety was at height that we moved back to Ipswich for the first time. So we've done that twice now. Anyway, and I found myself at Hillsong Conference in this summer, totally full of anxiety, managed to get myself in the room. And I was hearing this verse being spoken and I was battling because I was thinking, I love Jesus. I've had a faith for years. I've walked through a lot of stuff already and I know he's real. And I know that he died and set me free from my sin on the cross, but... I don't feel any type of freedom in my day-to-day -day life. This verse, the sun will set you free and you'll be free indeed. I thought, this just doesn't match up with what I'm walking through. And it was so frustrating because I'm thinking, what's the matter with me? My experience didn't align with what I was reading in God's word and it made me question God. And it was so frustrating. And maybe you guys can relate to that. But what do we do? What do we do as believers in Jesus when we don't feel like we have the freedom that he says in his word he's given to us? How do we, how do we make that right? How do, we, how do we navigate that in our lives? And I was thinking about what to share with you this morning and I came to the probably the most 
prominent example of from slavery to freedom that we see in the scriptures. And it's right back in the Old Testament when the Israelites are under the um, opposition of Pharaoh in Egypt. They've been experiencing slavery, forced labor for about 400 years. And I want us to turn in our Bibles, if we've got them, to Exodus chapter 6, verse 6 to 8. Don't worry if you don't have them. Wonderful Angela's already there in the chat. She's a legend. And this is where God is speaking to Moses. And he says this to Moses. He says, therefore, Moses, say to the people of Israel that I am the Lord. I will free you from your oppression and will rescue you from your slavery in Egypt. I will redeem you with a powerful arm and great acts of judgment. I will claim you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord, your God, who has freed you from your oppression in Egypt. I will bring you into the land I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. I will give it to you as your very own possession. I am the Lord. What an awesome promise that God is telling Moses to deliver to his people. But this is the verse that really stuck out to me as I read this thinking about this morning. In, in verse nine, it says this. So Moses told the people of Israel what the Lord had said, the amazing promise of freedom and rescue. But they refused to listen anymore. They had become too discouraged by the brutality of their slavery. They refused to listen anymore. They had become too discouraged by the brutality of their slavery. Perhaps you can relate to that if you're in your own journey to freedom. And that was me at that Hillsong conference. I was so discouraged. I felt like I've been asking you, God, for peace, for freedom, for all this time. And now you're throwing this verse at me. What do you want me to do? How, how is this? How is this my life? And I was totally stuck. I wanted to believe that there was freedom available to me, but I was so exhausted and so tired and just so lacking hope or belief that anything could change. And that is where the Israelites were when they heard that God was going to free them. And some of you are like that, stuck in your own slavery, whatever that thing might be, and losing hope for a life more free. And it can feel impossible to believe for something that's beyond what you've actually walked through yourself. But there was a quote that was said at this conference that made me sit up a little bit and take a bit of note. And it was Brian Houston who said this. He said, we have to raise our level of expectation above our level of experience. I'll say that again. We have to raise our level of expectation above our level of experience. And that is faith, isn't it? And that is difficult, but that is what God is calling us to do. So that, that's my story. That's where I was at this Hillsong conference and I was a mess and I had a long way to go. And I'm gonna share some things with you that were helpful for me and maybe they'll be helpful for you. They might not be helpful for you personally because maybe you're feeling free and it's great. And I hope that that's where you are because that's what the Bible promises us. But if it's not for you, maybe it's for someone you know that's walking through something, or maybe it's for someone you know who is walking with through something with someone that they love. And just some little bits of wisdom, some things that I've learned on the journey that I just want to share that hopefully will make a difference to someone and they've made a difference to me. So I came to the decision, really, that it was God's job to sort me out. And so I prayed for peace. And I wanted a miracle. That's what I wanted. And really, I prayed that and, and I tried to have expectation. I tried to do that thing where you're like I'm raising my expectation and mustering the faith to have this miracle. And I and I waited and, it, and nothing happened, really. And it was that was even more frustrating because I felt like I was trying to do this thing that I was told to do and it didn't work. And then it felt like, what's the what's the matter? And then it dawned on me that I wanted to receive peace and have this miracle but actually I wanted to be quite passive in the process I didn't really want to have to apply myself maybe I was too tired from everything that I'd walked through maybe I felt like there wasn't a lot of point maybe I felt that I wasn't really I didn't deserve everything that happened to me so why should I have to apply myself to freedom God should just give it to me that should be my right he says it in his word but actually I realized that there's more to it than that 
And I just want you to think about for a moment some of those wildlife documentaries that we see on the telly from time to time where there's been, say, a captive big cat. Maybe it's been injured. Maybe I don't know what's happened to it, but they're trying to re-release it into its natural habitat. They're trying to give it a chance at freedom again. And if you can picture the sort of big Jeep pulling up at a, a wildlife place or conservation or wherever, one of these more open spaces, and they put out the crate and someone tentatively lifts the door to see if this wild cat will take its step into freedom. There's a couple of seconds where you're waiting and the door is open, but that animal hasn't yet left the enclosure or the, the cage. And I, when I think about that, it seems incredibly simple what that animal has to do. It just has to take a few steps out of its cage into the freedom that's right in front of it. But it doesn't seem like it's an easy thing for that animal to do. It's quite frightening, isn't it? To go from what you actually know in your cage, it becomes quite familiar into a big wide space where there's freedom. And it's a choice to take those steps. And it's difficult. It's simple, but it's not easy. And I realise this, that freedom is a choice and that God is calling me to walk in freedom. But to walk in freedom, I have to walk. And it's hard. Sometimes we can think that we can't be free because perhaps our physical circumstance isn't looking likely to change. Maybe we've got something wrong with our physical bodies or maybe we've got a circumstance that we've prayed about, but it just seems to be the same. But freedom isn't always in our circumstance. It actually begins in our attitude and in our minds. So if we can begin to become free in our thinking and in our minds, we'll actually find that our circumstances aren't as limiting or as captive as captivating in that sense, not as in captive, that's the wrong word, but you know what I mean, they're, they're not as restricting as what we think they are if we can free our minds. So it's a choice. And we all have this story and we've got the chapters that have gone before that there's very little we can do about. And we find ourselves in this place now, but it's not the end of the story today. And I'm just gonna take us on a little journey. We have this God who's a miracle working God. He loves transformation, but not all transformation is instant. I'm gonna show my age, but I made me think of stars in their eyes where someone's like just their normal Joe blog self. And then they go through this door and like a second later, they come out with all the smoke and they're a new brand new celebrity. And the transformation seems with all the editing to be absolutely instant. But what you don't see is the hours and hours of makeup and hair and all of that that goes on behind the scenes. And I think sometimes we want that instant change. But actually, there's a lot that God wants to do with us in between where we are and where we're going to be that's going to teach us things for the future. So I'm going to walk you through now, guys, my ABCD to freedom. I hope that's all right. So I can't hear you, but I want you all to repeat nice and loud. A is for accept. Come on, I can see your mouths moving. I'm just hoping that <laughs> you're awake. A is for accept. So the very first thing in order to become free is to accept that there's an issue going on and accept our responsibility of our part to play within that. There's a problem, I need help. This is where I am, but I don't have to stay here. And this was quite a big journey for me to go, to go from with my mental health because actually what I believed is that at first was there's all these physical things wrong with my body and I had to accept that actually no what's going on here is an absolute fear response it's not to do with your physical health I had so many tests and blood pressure checks and all the rest of it just to see what the matter was and there was nothing wrong anymore I'd been through my physical health trials but now I needed to deal with the remnant of that which was just so much fear left in me but once I'd accepted that, there was something to work from. So A is for accept. B is for be ready. <laughs> B is for be ready. Get ready to move. I had these two revelations in my journey to freedom, and this was the first one. It was from Psalm 34, verse 14, and it was this. It says, turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Turn, do, seek, pursue. Those are all active words. 
I can't do those things lying in bed with my eyes shut, hoping that the world would be a better place. I have to move. And I had this sort of revelation that unless I applied myself to the process and did my bit, I was just going to end up staying where I am. Not because that's what God has given to me, but because I'm not choosing to play my part in finding my freedom. It's an active process. And I'm just going to give you a little snippet back to our Israelites, because after Moses had delivered their news of freedom on the horizon, there was a big battle for that freedom to occur. Many of you know the stories in the Old Testament. If you don't, get in there and read them, because there's such rich narrative to be found in those chapters. And this Exodus story is one of my favourites in the Bible. And the Israelites were waiting for Pharaoh to say they could be let free. But it sort of escalated first through all these nasty plagues. And they got to this final plague, which was horrendous, really. It was the spirit of death was going to pass over Egypt and all of the firstborn children were going to die that night. But God gave the Israelites a way out. He told them to sacrifice a a lamb and to paint its blood over their doorposts, which would cause the spirit of death to pass over their houses. And that's why we have Passover. And so they did this, sacrifice the lamb. Then they get to have roast lamb, which that sounds great to me. Uh, And then I want just you to see this in Exodus 12, verse 11. I love this verse so much. This is how you are to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It's the Lord's Passover. And what I love about this verse is they're eating this meal, but God's saying you need to be ready to move because when I move, you've got to move. And sometimes we're praying for a God move in our lives. But what we're not wanting is to have to get ready to do anything ourselves. We want to just receive what God's got for us without getting off our backsides, putting our shoes on and getting ready to go. And you know what is I find is often true is that God doesn't even necessarily move and then wait for us to move. He actually waits for us to make the first move because he wants to see our faith. He wants to see that we trust him, that if we will step forward into something a bit scary, he will meet us there and our freedom journey can start its move. And I don't know what it is that you might need to do to start your journey to freedom. I know for me, there were some really practical things that I could do first, and that was to stop looking at the NHS website. I needed to stop reading about all the symptoms and all the different illnesses that I might possibly have. I just needed to get off of that. In fact, I needed to cut a lot down on my screen time, stop comparing my life to other people's on social media. I know that comparison is the thief of joy and that was not helping me at all. I needed to come off social media. I needed to get into the word of God. That was something that was so important. Not that I hadn't been reading my Bible, that I needed to be much more intentional with what I was filling my head with. Um, Needed to get some good sleep rhythms going needed to watch how much caffeine I was drinking which is such a sort of silly thing but that was so it made such a difference Nath would say how many coffees have you had today and it would be too many and that's why I'm feeling a little bit on edge and sometimes it's a practical thing and we can start blaming all sorts of other things but actually we look at our rhythms in our lives there are things that we can adjust pretty easily that will make a big difference to what we're facing and this is obviously applies to my recovery from anxiety but if you're struggling with something else there may be different things that you need to look at but I would encourage you to take a look at your life and what's in front of you and where are the things what are the things that are causing triggers where are the things that you can adjust that might help you practically so we've done a is for accept and b is for be ready c is for commit to the process c is for commit to the process Oh my goodness, this is the one that nobody wants to do. And it's really, really hard. And I I said earlier that I'd had these two revelations on the journey. The first was the seek, pursue, pursue peace one. This one is from Galatians 5, verse 22 to 23. And it says this in the Bible. We know this so well. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace. Da, 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 da. Love, joy, peace. I had this thought that peace is a fruit. I don't really like fruit that much, but I like vegetables. It's okay. But the thing is with fruit, you can't plant a seed and then the next day eat your apple. It's such a long process from the seed going in the ground to the plant growing. And then the fruit only comes in a certain season. And and I just thought 
there's a process here. I'm going to put some stuff in the ground and it's not going to be instant. I'm going to have to start with some small steps and I'm going to have to make these changes. And I might not see any difference for quite a long time, but I need to be committed. And for some of you this morning, you're wanting some freedom in an area of your life and you've started off OK, but you've given up because it's taking too long. Like Pastor Esther said, it's faith and patience. And those two things have got to work in tandem for us to get somewhere on these journeys. So commit to the process, find someone to walk the journey with. I cannot tell you how much my husband has had to endure in my journey from being an emotional mess of anxiety. And that's let alone all the physical stuff he had to walk through with me before that. But to get into a place where even I can sit here and speak to you this morning without having had a massive row with him beforehand, because I've been so anxious, I've been just taking everything out on him. He's such a supportive man and he has walked this journey so faithfully with me and encouraged me to get into God's presence. He's helped me with scriptures. He's listened to me. He's tried to understand what I've walked through. And you all need these people in your lives that are going to actually come alongside you and that love you no matter what happens and are going to help you. And he's actually often been the one to point out to me, well, hang on a minute. You feel a bit like this today because you didn't sleep well a couple of nights ago. And you feel a bit like this today because actually you've had four cups of tea and two cans of Coke this morning. And I don't think you should do that again. And so he's actually the one who can see things that I don't always see and help me make those adjustments and be more consistent. So find someone to journey with. Be really honest with God how it's going. He can take it. So just give it to him. And, and it's fine. He knows that it's going to be hard and he wants us to walk the journey. So he's going to equip us to do it. He doesn't make us walk through anything that we can't overcome. So get alongside him. Don't fight him, but try and allow him to work through you and teach you the things he's trying to teach you because there's a lot of rich lessons to be learned in our struggles and some things that we learn in our struggles we would never ever learn in any other circumstance in life so we have to learn to embrace that to change our perspective about our battles into something that we want to be engaged in because we know that God is shaping us and changing us in a way that nothing else could do he doesn't want to just put us through rubbish stuff in our life just for the sake of it there's always a purpose in our pain always a purpose in our pain and so with my little revelation about peace being a fruit I started to plant seeds of God's word in my heart a bit like um, a weapon in my hand if I felt anxious I decided I need to commit to memory some scriptures and use them like declarations in my life so if I felt anxious I had something to go at it with it was like this is what I'm gonna do this is my battle plan so I just get, I've got a list of, I think it's six scriptures. I'm just going to read out to you that were my declarations for my journey and that you can take them for yourself. They're just in the Bible. I didn't make them up. And um, they were so helpful for me. And I still repeat them now from time to time if I'm having a wobble. So these are my, my declarations that I used. And it was this one was the first one. This was probably my most significant one. It's Proverbs 31, mm. verse 25. And it says, she is clothed with strength and dignity and she laughs without fear of the future. And I'd realized I'd stopped laughing and I like to laugh, I laugh a lot. But in this season of life, I hardly laughed at all. And I was so frightened about things that might not even ever happen that I'd stopped enjoying life. And so this was so important to me to be clothed with strength and dignity when I didn't feel dignified, when I didn't feel strong. That was what God was clothing me with and that I could laugh because I didn't need to fear the future. That was a massive one for me. So then we got Psalm 34, verse 14, and just that bit at the end of it, seek peace and pursue it. I'm going to have to find peace, but then it's going to elude me. So I'm going to have to pursue it and make that a part of my daily rhythms. This one is, I think, Pastor Richard's one of his favourite verses, because I'll definitely pinch this off of him from one of the messages he gave at Fields. It says, it's Isaiah 26, verse 3, it says, you keep him in perfect peace, him whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. And I wanted God to know that I was trusting him. And then I wanted his peace. <laughs> Isaiah 43, verse 19. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And then Colossians 3 verse 2, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Romans 8 37, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And then the very last thing that I started to do 
more recently, actually, if I was having a bit of a wobble and not managing to sleep, I would say Psalm 23, or I memorised it and say it to myself in my head. It's such a fam famous psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. After a while, I realised that saying it in my head wasn't doing the trick because I was getting distracted. So I started to just lie in bed and say it out loud. I don't know what Nate thought I was doing, but it's happened so often now that every night we both say Psalm 23 before we go to sleep. And it's been become such a good habit to just speak scripture over ourselves. In fact, I'm now even planning, I'm gonna print it out, put it next to the kids' beds, and we're gonna say it over them before they go to sleep as well, because what else do you wanna fill your head with before you lie down to try and, and sleep? And then just two more practical things on this commit to the process situation. We don't have to fight some of the things that are in the world to help us. Like I still went to the GP when I had wobbles about certain symptoms that I didn't quite understand or was, were new because I needed some reassurance and that's what they're there for. We mustn't neglect taking medication if we're prescribed it because it's there to help us. God uses these people to help us. And, and so I needed that reassurance. The other thing that was really, really helpful for me is this book. And I don't know if anyone's resting with anxiety, but if you are, I would definitely recommend this. It's by Dr. Claire Weeks and it's called Self Help for Your Nerves. And it's a really old book, but it is so good. It, she literally describes how you're feeling and helps you to understand why that's happening in your body. And it's just for me, as someone who likes to understand process and what's actually happening, that was so helpful. And it just, I could go back to that, find a new symptom. Oh no, that's in there too. Oh, it's all right, it's just my nerves. And just get over it. And it's, it's been really helpful. So don't neglect the resources that are out there to help you. So we've done A for accept, B for be ready, C for commit to the process, and D is for do it again. God brought the Israelites out of slavery. That was not the last time they needed rescuing. Read Exodus. Oh my goodness, these people. But they're just a shadow of our own lives, aren't they? That we can free us, that get free from something. And then we walk into the next challenge and we quite, can quite quickly learn that we haven't managed to actually sort, sort this out in our perspective, in our minds, and we can allow ourselves to become trapped again. And so, Doing these things doesn't mean we're not going to have challenges to face. We absolutely are. But if we can commit to going back to the beginning, accepting the new situation we're in, being ready and readdressing the changes that we might need to make, committing to that process, we're going to, over time, find ourselves much better equipped for the challenges we face to keep on top, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. And actually, you'll see so much growth in your life because you're in that process. And instead of challenges being difficult and, and imprisoning us again, they can actually work to be a continuing testimony of God's amazing love and faithfulness to us. He is so gracious. He doesn't just want to leave us how we are. He wants us to go through challenge because he wants us to grow. He wants to see us more and more like his son. The ultimate aim is that we find salvation. But after that, he wants us to be more like Jesus. And so anything that we go through, he will use. It's the Bible says, God works all things for the good of those who love him. So we have to trust him in that, that he's working those things for good. And I was just going to stop at D, but I spoke to Pastor Richard the other day and I thought, you know, what? I'm going to give you an E. E is for empathy for other, with others. And if I've learned anything, it's that the things I've walked through are going to actually help other people that are walking through challenge, if I'll be open enough with my story, it will help other people. And the number of times that I've spoken to someone and I've been able to just share even a little bit of what I've walked through and I've seen them visibly relax because they can see someone understands and then they can open up and you can pray with them or you can encourage them. It's a blessing to be able to have something in your hand to offer to someone else who's really struggling and to be able to give that in a time of need. So, to have empathy for others who are struggling to be free, but also to have empathy for those who are walking with the captive. It's so difficult for people who are trying to support someone who's battling with these things, especially with something like anxiety, that they, they don't have a full understanding of what it's like if they haven't walked through it themselves. So if you've walked through it and you're seeing them try and support someone who has, you might be able to offer some advice or some help to that person so always be aware of who's around you and what they're walking through and if there's anything of your story or your journey that might help to impact them in a positive way take what you've learned and help others to get free with it so we've done a b c d e f is for free 
And my final verse for you is Galatians 5 verse 1. It says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And I just think it's fantastic because we can do that. God can set us free. I can be a testimony to you this morning that I am free from anxiety. And, you know, I shared that the biggest part of my anxiety was anything to do with health. I've just walked through a pandemic with all the rest of you that is completely around health and I've not felt anxious I've had an odd little wobble if I'm honest I've had an odd little wobble but I've not had any panic attacks I've not been sick I've not I've not had I've not been crippled by fear I've been aware that there's a situation going on but I've walked through it with faith and and that would absolutely not have been the case five years ago I would have been an absolute mess if this had hit five years ago and I am aware that for some of you this has hit at the wrong time and it's made things so much worse because you were already struggling and I just want you to know that when we're discouraged just like those Israelites it doesn't change God's plan for freedom for us he still wants us to find freedom and it doesn't matter where we are the story doesn't end today there is a future for each of us and so just to close I just want to pray I'm going to pray for two groups of people the first people I want to pray for are those who are feeling like those Israelites, totally stuck, not having any hope, finding it hard and whatever it is that you're battling with, it might be a similar story to me or it might be something totally different that, that I haven't shared, but hopefully there's some tools here, but also that God, God can give you ideas and creativity in your mind for how you can start to take that journey to freedom as well. So we're gonna open the door for that to happen this morning. And then I wanna pray for anyone who doesn't know this, this savior that frees us from sin and who helps us to walk into freedom in our lives as well. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for your grace over our lives. We thank you that our stories carry so much more than just a basic narrative of what we've walked through, but that they're so rich with stories of your faithfulness and your heart for us. And Father, just pray for those of us this morning who are battling, Father, who feel trapped, who are struggling in their circumstances, for those who are losing hope that there is a freedom for them. And we just speak again this morning that that verse, whom the sun sets free shall be free indeed. And I thank you, Father, that that is your heart for us, that we find freedom, that we would be able to walk in peace and in victory because of what you've done on the cross, Jesus, but also because that is your heart for us, to have a full life on earth and then to walk with you in eternity in heaven. So I just thank you, God, for these people who are struggling, that even today you would give them encouragement, you would help them to lift their eyes. Father, I pray you would help them to identify the areas in their lives that they can play a part in starting the journey of, of walking to freedom, Lord, those practical things they might be able to do themselves. Father, I pray you would bring alongside them those who can support and encourage them on their journeys as well. And we thank you that there is a road to freedom, that you haven't left us to flounder around in the dark on our own, but that you walk with us. Holy Spirit, we welcome you into our hearts, that you would help us to find freedom again, that you'd give us strength and courage to walk out of the cage and into that amazing open landscape of possibility that you place before us. And for those of you who, who don't know this God who promises us freedom, I'm just going to give you an opportunity now to, to get to know him. And it's so simple. All we have to do is accept him into our lives. He's knocking on that door. If we will open the door, he will come and fill our hearts. And all we need to do is accept Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. He died on a cross and when he did that, he took the sin and the shame that we should have taken. But he takes that on our behalf and he frees us from that bondage of sin so that we can actually have a restored relationship with our Holy Father in heaven. And not only that, that we can have eternal life, that this life is so temporary and what we walk through here is so temporary compared to what he's promised us if we we'll trust him. And so if that's you this morning, I'm just going to give you an opportunity to say, yes, Lord, I want to welcome you into my heart. I want to turn away from the wrong decisions that I've been making. I want to accept your forgiveness. 
And he absolutely gives that to you freely. And so, Father, we just pray you'd go with each of us into our weeks, the different things that we've got going on, that you would help us, you'd equip us for all that we're doing, give us wisdom, give us enjoyment and encouragement on our days. And we just pray that you would bring favour on England this afternoon in the Euros in the opening match. Look after Gareth Southgate as he looks after our men and help us to have victory. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> So I think now the breakout rooms are going to be open for some cafe time. Thank you so much for letting me share. I'm sorry, I went on a little bit. I do do that. <laughs>